What up? I'm Ben Freeman from Freemanpedia.com, and it's been 72 years since we last met here on the dozen dates to know for AP World History Modern. And today, we are now past the halfway point on our made-up timeline of dates you actually don't have to know over here. And you may recall 72 years ago, I was like, 1776 was all about freedom and rights for the people. Yeah, that's true for some people. People like this, and this, and this and this, they all did pretty well for themselves after 1776. But I feel like we're leaving out certain groups of people. People like this, and this, and this, and this. So 1776 wasn't some magical year. The Americans won't live up to the all men are created equal part of the 1776 declaration until soonish, hopefully. And not just us either. Those other revolutions will also fail to live up to the lofty goals of their founders. Haiti turns into a dictatorship. France also turns into a dictatorship, and Bolivar's dream of a united, enlightened Latin America died with him in 1830. Think of the Enlightenment revolutions beginning in a rush of glory and promise with some very positive outcomes. But also think of those Enlightenment revolutions as never being able to live up to their lofty promises. They're kind of like Kanye West. Yay. Your first album came out when I was just out of college, and you had so much promise. Early on, you dropped some classics. But lately, like... What are you doing? Like, yay, seriously, what's going on? Yay, I know you watch all of these videos, call me. So 1776 wasn't perfect, but that was the last video. It's time we focus on two groups that were overlooked by both Thomas Jefferson and Adam Smith back in 1776. And historically, 1848 is a super busy year. But remember, this is a world history class. So US gold rushes and European revolutions and Mexican-American wars are for other classes like AP US history or AP Euro. Today, we've landed in 1848 and two of the most important and influential movements in all of history can lay claim to 1848 as one of their most important years. It's just that 808s and Heartbreak, followed by My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, were absolute fire. And lately I'm just like, who are you, Kanye? So I mentioned in the intro that there were two groups who finally get some much needed historical attention in 1848. And you know what that means. This is gonna take a couple contexts. Ladies first. Here's a bold statement. The most oppressed group of all time is women. It's not even close. Ever since some cave dude decided to start farming, it was a downward spiral of oppression that lasts to this day. Oh, you think there's another group that's more oppressed? Okay, watch this. The women of that group is the most oppressed group in history. See what I did there? And 1848 is not the first time women show up in this course. The Sufi poet Aisha was in Unit 1. The Traveler Marjorie Kemp was in Unit 2. The Taj Mahal was built for a woman in Unit 3, but it was for her dead body. Unit 4 had Anna Nzinga standing up to the Portuguese, but it's not until Unit 5 that we see women writing and fighting for their rights. After those rich landowning white males got their rights after 1776, women immediately began to push for their rights. Mary Wollstonecraft, aka Mary Shelley's mom, wrote a vindication of the rights of women. And it's not like Wollstonecraft was like, women should rule the world. She was like, women should be educated. It's a revolutionary idea. In France, Olympe de Gouges directly challenged the patriarchy by taking the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen and making them applicable to women as well. I made a whole video on this with anti-social studies own Mrs. Glinkler. If you want to know more, I'll link that down below. Long context short, she gets her head cut off with the guillotine. De Gouges did, not Mrs. Glinkler. She's doing just fine. So by 1848, women were tired of waiting on their rights and held the first women's rights conference in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. Wait, wasn't there another group that was overlooked in 1776 that had some impact on 1848? Remember back in 1776, I said that Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations was the second most referenced social science book before 1950? And then I was like, you'll have to wait until 1848 to find out who the most referenced author was. No, well, it was towards the end, so. Well, that author was none other than Karl Marx, and the second overlooked group that got some much needed attention in 1848 was the worker. Yeah, people like this, and this, and this. 1776 was awesome for the land-holding white elite. What about the worker? Also, hold on, let's use our vocabulary here. Don't call them the workers, call them the proletariat. Proletariat were a group in the Roman Empire who owned little or no property. But Karl Marx popularized the term for the modern social class whose only real possession of value was their labor. And Smith didn't overlook the proletariat in 1776, but his book was mostly about removing the restrictions on a free market and allowing the invisible hand to guide the economy. 
Well, that invisible hand tended to lean heavily towards the rich upper classes. So as the Industrial Revolution raged after 1750, the worker had less and less power in the industrial economy. But according to Marx, it was the proletariat who would soon rise up and overthrow all social structures to set up a communist society. This was the main idea of his pamphlet, The Communist Manifesto. Guess when he wrote it? 1848. Oh, and the most cited social science book prior to 1950 was his much longer work, Das Kapital. But that's like in 1867. So. so the proletariat was pushing for better rights in the workplace, and women were pushing for better rights on the planet. But why does 1848 matter? Like, pause this video and listen to 808's and Heartbreak and tell me which of those songs isn't amazing. I'll wait. It's like the preamble to the declaration, it just works. But then look at what he just released. I'm gonna use this video for a while on this channel, so I'm assuming whatever he most recently put out wasn't that great. I'm just saying, do better, Kanye. 1848 marks a much needed correction on the failures of the Enlightenment-based revolutions that took place after 1776. And look where this year falls in the curriculum. We are 100 years into the modern period, 1750 to 1900. 1848 tells you that Jefferson's All Men Are Created Equal and Smith's Invisible Hand were not getting it done. Groups were overlooked and diminished in this new democratic capitalist society. 1848 matters because 1776 was not perfect, and more than half the planet remained at best second-class citizens, and at worst, a repressed class of humans that was being subjugated and intentionally restrained by the new elites of the modern period. And notice I haven't even mentioned the enslaved Africans and African Americans. For the enslaved, 1848 was just another year of being treated as subhuman slave labor. It would be another 20 years before slavery truly began to come to an end. So that's why 1848 matters. Women and workers made or began to make significant strides towards equality, both socially and economically. But what actually happened in 1848? Without exaggeration or hyperbole, my beautiful dark twisted fantasy is a masterpiece. There, I said it. Da Vinci had the Mona Lisa, Michelangelo the Sistine Chapel, Tarantino has Inglorious Bastards, I have Ottoman tax farming. Tax farming. And Kanye has this album. It's perfect. Is there someone we can call to help Kanye get back to this? Sure, he's had some hits since then. Yeezus was fine. But the rest of the catalog is spotty at best. Again, we're looking at two events here. So let's start with the 1848 Seneca Falls Conference in New York. We saw the context of women writing and fighting for their rights a minute ago, so 1848 wasn't out of the blue. Think of it more as a culmination of thousands of women's rights activists and writers over the past decades. It was a time to stop writing and start acting. And in July of 1848, Lucretia Mott and her husband called some prominent Quaker women's rights activists and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, she was the only non-Quaker present, to their house for tea to discuss women's subservient status in society. Most of the houses of the five participants at the planning meeting served as stops on the underground Railroad. And they came to the conclusion that women needed a convention of all the people who saw women's rights as crucial to the future of humanity. They met for two days in 90 degree heat, and they eventually wrote the Declaration of Sentiments. Earlier when I said that Olympe de Gouges had changed the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen to include women, the Declaration of Sentiments is worded nearly exactly the same as the U.S. Declaration of Independence even the part of the Declaration where Jefferson lists complaints against the king. The Declaration of Sentiments lists complaints against the patriarchy. The most notable of these declarations was the right to vote. Okay, again, let's use our vocabulary, people. The Declaration demanded suffrage for all women. Abolitionist Frederick Douglass even came and spoke on the second day. In regards to the women's suffrage, he said, in this denial of the right to participate in government, not merely the degradation of women and the perpetuation of a great injustice happens, but the maiming and repudiation of one half of the moral and intellectual power of the government of the world. Some people supported the ideas of this conference, but to give you an idea of what women were up against in 1848, let me read this response to this convention from the paper of record from the nearby town of Oneida, New York. The Oneida Whig stated, This bolt is the most shocking and unnatural incident ever recorded in the history of humanity. If our ladies will insist on voting and legislating, where, gentlemen, will be our dinners? <laughs> I've had to rewind this like three times. Like, that's hard to just say out loud. But that gives you an idea of what they're up against. Remember how I said women were the most oppressed group ever? Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Meanwhile, in Europe, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels published the Communist Manifesto in February. This 23-page pamphlet starts with the line, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. Set against the backdrop of the Industrial Revolution, which was nearly 100 years old at this point, Marx and Engels argued that the proletariat would rise up and seize the means of production. The means of production 
are all the things that go into producing goods and products. From there, a classless society would emerge where all wealth is shared. There's more to it than that, but this video is already running a little long, so that's the basics. In Germany, it was widespread enough to play a role in the failed 1848 revolution there. It was so much of a factor that it got Karl Marx banned for life from Germany. He moved to London where he would spend the last 35 years of his life. Not surprisingly, Vladimir Lenin loved it. He said in 1914, just three years before the communist revolution in Russia, that with the clarity and brilliance of genius, this work outlines a new world conception, the creator of a new communist society. And he meant that literally, as the Great War provided the perfect backdrop for Lenin to put Marxist theories into practice in what would become the Soviet Union. But that's like two full dozen dates from now. So women and workers have now thrown down the gauntlet. They want rights. When do they want them? 1848. Like, yay, you were crawling up the list of the greatest rappers of all time. Like, you were moving past some pretty heavy hitters, but now I'm just, I'm just not saying it. So, you know, at me, yay. I don't want to give too much away here, but after 1848, the women's rights movement takes off. They will go on to hold more conferences, marches, writings, protests. All of this work will culminate in suffrage rights being granted to women almost worldwide in the 20th century. As for the Communist Manifesto, it had no real impact and was mostly forgotten. Just kidding, it had a massive impact and you will spend most of the last period, the contemporary period, 1900 to present, dealing with the socialist and communist revolutions that it inspired. I'm talking China, I'm talking the Soviet Union, Korea, Vietnam, Latin America. Wait, 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 wait. Society is tearing apart at the seams with women and workers trying to break free from millennia of oppression to finally get the rights and respect they deserve and you weren't even paying attention. Fine. Kanye West was a rapper whose career started on an amazing trajectory before ultimately cooling off. Much like Yeezy, the promises of 1776 did not reach their lofty goals either. Women convened in Seneca Falls, New York in what became known as the Seneca Falls Convention. The Declaration of Sentiments they created called for an end to oppression and even suffrage or the right to vote for women. Meanwhile, in Europe, Marx and Engels penned the Communist Manifesto. Building on the ills of free market capitalism and the Industrial Revolution, Marx sought to economically lay out how the proletariat, or worker, would rise up and seize the means of production, ending in a classless, egalitarian society. So society is a changing, but some things never change, like how powerful states will exert their dominance over weaker states. And the worst example of that in the history of ever took place at one conference in Berlin that decided the fate of African history for generations. But you'll have to wait another 36 years for this conference, all the way to the year 1884. 